Hello, my name is Sean Burgess. I'm a senior associate with the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies here at the Australian National University. And today it's my pleasure to be talking with Professor Abraham Lowenthal. Uh, professor Lowenthal is a professor emeritus at the University of Southern California and at the uh, Pacific Council on International Affairs as well as a research professor with the Watson Institute at uh, Brown University. He's also a non-resident fellow at uh, the Brookings Institute in, uh, in Washington and he is uh, significantly, particularly for those of us working on Latin America, the founding director of both the Latin American program at the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Center for Scholars and of the Inter-American Dialogue. Um, author of numerous books and countless articles and I think it's safe to say that uh, if you work on the Americas, if you work on democratization, whether you remember that you've read Lowen Professor Lowenthal's work, um, <laughs> Everything that you've looked at has been touched by it. Uh, his his work runs as a theme through pretty much the entire canon in about eight different languages. It's uh, so it's a pleasure today, Professor Lowenthal, to have you with us. Thank you very much. Uh, but now, if I might start with the questions, is just to, to ask you, can you tell us a little bit about the current project that you're you're working on? The project that I've just finished uh, and will now be spending some time uh, spreading the word on it. Uh, is a, a project sponsored by International Idea in uh, Stockholm, uh, in which Sergio Bitar from Chile, a well-known uh, pu public intellectual and political figure there, and I had the opportunity to go around the world interviewing former presidents and prime ministers, 13 of them in nine different countries, uh, three in Latin America, two in Asia, two in Africa, and two in Europe who have played important roles in leading transitions from authoritarian rule toward democratic uh, governance. Um, the object of the exercise of interviewing these leaders, which we did on a well-prepared basis and with adequate time to really explore the issues, is to see whether we can learn from the experience of people who've actually been successful at crafting democratic transitions, whether there are some principles and procedures and points that would be relevant to people elsewhere in the world today and tomorrow who want to try to make democracy happen in their countries, whether it be in Myanmar or in, in uh, North Africa or uh, the Middle East or in Cuba or wherever. And uh, so we had the opportunity to t talk with these leaders and to hear them express in their own voices and in their own words what the tough choices were they had to face. Uh, how and why they made their decisions, uh, and how they pulled off what, when you think about it, is a pretty implausible assignment uh, to undo authoritarian rule and move toward democratic governance. It's no easy trick. Now, the democratic transition, it is a uh, <coughs> big social upheaval, and it's a big change within a country, but how important is the role of a specific leader within that process? We felt, uh, based on these nine cases and uh, the 13 interviews, that uh, in a way not enough attention has been paid by the professional social science community that is looking for quantifiable data and looking for underlying social structures and economic uh, data and so on. Not enough attention is being paid, perhaps, to the fundamental importance of good political leadership of political leaders who are able to uh, broaden the support base for a move toward democracy, to reconcile differing, often extremely polarized uh, groups in the opposition to an incumbent authoritarian regime, who are able to build bridges to people within the authoritarian regime who understand they need an exit strategy, uh, who are able to make hard decisions about who gets excluded from the uh, opposition movement because their demands are too destabilizing for a transition, uh, who are able to make uh, compromises and uh, reach judgments about what issues need to be dealt with now and which can be postponed, uh, who are able to deal with issues of transitional justice, of civil-military relations, of a variety of recurrent issues that cannot be uh, resolved by swallowing a particular pill. Uh, they require uh, consistent uh, movement in a direction with a strategy, with a, a nimbleness about responding to 
uh, opportunities and contingencies. In every one of these uh, uh, transitions, there were unexpected events, for example, that really required uh, deft leadership to respond to. In the, in the case of Brazil, for example, which you know well, uh, you know, Tancredo Neves was, mm -hmm. was uh, central casting's answer uh, to the question how to have a civilian opposition political figure who could credibly uh, win an election and, and govern. And then, having been elected, uh, he suffered a mortal illness. He was never inaugurated. His vice presidential candidate, who had been chosen in order precisely to build a, a basis for a, uh, a consensual approach and to, to broaden the support base, was in fact a conservative from the inner sanctum of the military government. So after all this effort to build a, an electoral democratic strategy, they wind up uh, with somebody from the military mm -hmm. regime. That was something that the people who were trying to bring democracy to Brazil hadn't counted yeah. on. Uh, and yet they were able to respond and to deal with it. So with all of these challenges then, and the challenges that we know that there will be challenges in a democratic transition, what, what are some of the things that you, you found in the research that point to the characteristics of, of somebody who makes a good leader for a democratic transition? Well, I think in a sense, it, uh, some of it has to do with leadership skills more generally. But uh, I think we, we found these are people, first of all, who had a strong preference for incremental step-by-step uh, uh, -step approaches rather than thinking there was some breakthrough uh, uh, quick solution, who understood that it will take time and who had patience and not only had patience themselves, but were able to uh, communicate to their followers not to lose heart and to hang on, uh, uh, who were able to make compromises. It's, it's not a task for the dogmatic, uh, but on the other hand, who had some basic principles that they uh, stuck to, uh, who uh, understood, for example, that in the making of a constitution, which is a fundamentally important part of getting to democratic governance. Uh, it's not, it's, it's of course important what the Constitution <laughs> says and provides, but it's not necessary to have a perfect solution for all time to every issue. And what's really important is to have a fundamental approach which has broad buy-in, uh, which people understand is a way forward, uh, and to, uh, even if it's necessary to accept some provisions that you don't really want to be permanent, but you can be f dealt with at a later stage. You think, uh, for example, of, of Chile, a country I, I know you also know well, where, uh, you know, they incorporated, uh, frankly, undemocratic yeah. provisions, uh, but with the understanding that there was no way to get out of the hole they were in without giving some reassurance to the armed forces uh, and to conservative business sectors, and that they could deal with some of those issues uh, at a later stage, as they have done to a large extent. So, democratic transitions, it remains something that's very much in the news today. I mean, we could talk about it in the context of what's going on in Iraq, the, of Afghanistan, and for Australian foreign policy, though it's not getting much media play at the moment, questions to do with Fiji, the Solomon Islands, and the general Asia-Pacific region. So, I know in the past you've done an awful lot of work on the international aspects of democratization. So, I wonder if you could, from pulling a bit from the findings from your research, Give us a bit of a sense of you know, what's the role of the international community in supporting and advancing these processes? That's a good question. Uh, in the early literature on uh, democratic transitions, the famous O'Donnell Schmutter Whitehead volumes and uh, those that followed it, uh, I think the role of the international sector, of international actors, of the foreign policies of major governments, international organizations, transnational uh, civil society organizations, uh, the media, religious groups, trade unions, and so on, was understudied uh, and was, was not given enough attention. Uh, there was really, a, well, I think, a, a commitment to thinking of this as something which is done nationally. And after all, the very notion of democratic governance, of self-governance, is mm -hmm. that it's, it is the people themselves in a given jurisdiction who uh, are taking responsibility. But as we look at these cases, it's clear that international actors played an important role. The sanctions in South Africa, 
uh, the pressure on the Pinochet government to allow free access or at least reasonable access by the opposition to the media. Uh, the, the, the roles of uh, uh, various uh, actors in uh, perhaps most uh, strongly in, in Ghana, but in, in every one of these cases, the role of the U.S. first as a bulwark of the Marcos regime and then uh, as a real supporter of the, the People Power movement and of Cory Aquino and the transition to Ramos in the Philippines. And so we tried to look at, uh, first of all, realistically, international actors played an important role. Uh, and they seem to have been helpful in these cases, by and large. And why was that? And I think it was because there were in these countries domestic, national, political actors, parties and leaders who knew how to mobilize international uh, sanctions, international pressures, international advice, international experience in line with a strategy that they developed. In other words, it was not that democracy was being exported from the United States, the EU, Australia, or anybody else. It was that political actors in South Africa and Chile and Poland and a number of other countries uh, were able to mobilize international uh, energies and, and resources to support their efforts. I think that's a very important lesson. That is, international support and international interest in democratization should not be ignored. It is important. It cannot be successful by trying on a cookie cutter approach to just take a, a set of institutions and say, here, do this. Certainly some of the things that have been done in, in Iraq, for example, to uh, uh, take a, a case you mentioned, uh, are very far from uh, the approach that we see in these cases and that have been successful. It doesn't make sense for international actors to try to replace domestic uh, political processes. But they can be helpful if they have the right time frame, which is uh, medium to long term, not next week. Uh, and if they are backing and supporting genuinely democratic local actors who have a strategy and an ability to move forward. It's wonderful. Um, thank you very much for sharing us with some of the findings from your book, which is going to be out uh, in 2015. And uh, it is one that uh, we'll definitely be looking for and is definitely going to be making the reading list here at the ANU. And I can't wait to see it myself. Thanks very much.